Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe video, recording once again here from our New York City office and actually recording a little earlier in the week than normal because of the Good Friday uh, holiday as we get ready to go into uh, Passover and uh, the um, Easter weekend. Uh, the markets will be closed on Friday, so we want to get this out to you on Thursday. Uh, so a little short week, but nevertheless quite a bit to kind of cover here today. So um, let me let me jump right into it here on the video. Uh, the global growth story. This is something I could do an hour or two on uh, easily if uh, you were so inclined to be watching a video of my face for that long. Um, but I'm going to keep it shorter than that here right now. The 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 strongly held opinions on both sides of this issue one that global growth is rapidly decelerating and and lingers as a potential issue for us investors um or uh, uh, another position that says no there's nothing to see here and and things are all going to snap back you know into place um, call it an overly uh, bullish high conviction or an overly bearish high conviction, not about the U.S. stock market, but about specifically global growth and where it will fit into things. I think both of those um, perspectives, if they're accompanied by a real high degree of conviction, um, uh, maybe an excessive amount of confidence, are problematic. And the reason is that as much as any time that I can remember, I mean, I, I've gone through periods where data was very, very uh, negative um, and rather clearly so and rather emphatically or persuasively so. And we're going through periods where it was very hard to find data that was negative. The bulk of the time, you have data that's pretty clearly positive in one sense um, oh, and with some, with you know, a couple of negative outliers or vice versa. There's a pretty negative trend with a couple positive outliers. But as far as the data being as completely um, intermixed as it is right now, it, it's hard for me to remember a time that is like this. You, you, you see copper prices around the globe moving higher, along with all other industrial metals, those industrial commodities, um, indicating strength. And you see manufacturing expanding, um, but not quite at the same pace it had been. But then you see the services sector uh, contracting a bit. Um, you, you see uh, Chinese uh, credit default swaps, meaning the insurance one would take against the concept of Chinese sovereign debt defaulting being at the lowest price it's been at now in a year. And you see European uh, high yield credit default swaps, uh, the insurance you take against some of the junkier corporate bonds in Europe at the cheapest level they've been. But then you see the absolute yields that the bond markets in China and especially in Europe represent, and it tells a story of weakening global growth. Uh, so I, I could give a lot more examples with less alphabet soup in them than CDS, you know, the credit default swap stuff. I, I use those to make an example because they're pretty emphatic to me, but the story right now of global growth is highly um, mixed. And, 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 and on top of that, the way in which global growth distress would be translated into the American economy is very unknown. And so I think that we're just in a period where a lot of humility and a lot of um, balance and a lot of, of data monitoring is important. Because if one wants to go search for data to support a pre-formed conclusion, they will find it. What, regardless of what the conclusion may be, and I think that's important, and and it, it keeps people that are are sensitive to cognitive um, biases. Um, it, it keeps people like us very, uh, shall we say, hesitant to join that fray. Uh, right now, it is my belief that uh, the U.S. economy is doing very well. And I certainly am open to the idea that one of the things that could represent a threat to the U.S. economy is if global conditions worsened enough that the U.S. got caught into the fray. And we all know the statistic that it's over 40% of revenues of S&P 500 companies 
uh, that come from overseas in, in terms of their global businesses and global uh, multinational franchises that um, make up such a big part of the S&P. So, uh, you know, we're about even on the week in the market, maybe down a little bit here. As I look up at uh, one of my screens, I see that the Dow is down right now here on Wednesday morning, uh, a, a, a tad. Um, obviously, it's been a pretty consistent run in the markets here for most of this uh, this year. And I think three of the last weeks have been positive, three uh, weeks in a row. So maybe that gets interrupted a little bit this week, but so much is hinging around just really where we are in the global economy. And, and some of the data has come back a little bit more positive than expected in Europe. It's making some folks that were a bit more hesitant before more bullish. And I get that, although I just think that data exists on both sides and we want to be very careful. It's a pretty long uh, setup to make that point, but I do hope you appreciate what I'm what, what I'm thinking of why. Uh, in terms of Federal Reserve, there's uh, more and more talk. I, I, I heard the vice chair of the Fed board use an expression this week, and I have this very strong feeling you're going to hear more and more of this expression now from the media, um, insurance cut. And it's a reference to the idea that, like, oh, we could cut rates, and it's not because we think the economy is weakening. It would just be an insurance cut to kind of eh, maybe really – help insure against any sort of weakening coming in. Um, and, and of course, we know that politically, um, and I write about this quite a bit in the politics and money section this week at Dividend Cafe, uh, that the president's obviously exerting a lot of pressure on the Fed to not, uh, not only to not raise rates anymore, but to, to even cut further from here. Um, I think that uh, I, I still maintain my view that it would be a mistake for them to, to uh, perform an insurance cut. He alluded to the fact that they had done such in 1995 and 1998, and I thought that was an interesting analogy considering how those uh, periods ended. Um, it, it obviously exacerbated, particularly the 1998 cut in October 98, exacerbated um, risk levels in the market and in, in credit and in risk assets, and <clears throat> it didn't end very well, if you remember, just in terms of the technology boom and subsequent bust. So I hate to use that as sort of an example uh, about why an insurance cut may be in order. Um, central banks, I do have a few things I wax and wane on in Dividend Cafe this week I'll share with you. They're in a very uh, difficult pickle, and I don't, I don't blame them for it. I don't think it's their responsibility or their fault to manage the debt that politicians and, and populations may incur. But the fact of the matter is that the Fed and, and other central banks are well aware that there's excessive indebtedness in the economic society, whether it be corporate borrowings or governmental borrowings, there's excessive debt. And one of the things you can do to curtail that debt, which could become problematic in your economy, is you can raise interest rates, which disincentivizes the growth of credit. Uh, but then one of the things that uh, you do is perhaps invite pain that is worse than the problem you're trying to solve for to begin with. Uh, and what I mean by that is the idea that by raising interest rates in, in a period of excessive debt and economic maybe timidity, uh, you make the risk of creating a self-fulfilling prophecy and a negative feedback loop uh, in kind of a deflationary spiral. And, and I think the Fed is extremely sensitive to that in our country, and I think uh, Draghi is sensitive to that in Europe as well. And, and a lot of this comes down to, and forgive me if I'm boring you, but I think it's important, and, and so I want to make this point. Uh, the Fed and central banks in general, by the way, are really well positioned to deal with crises of liquidity, um, the lender of last resort kind of idea. Uh, but they are not well positioned, nor are they equipped to deal with crises of solvency. And so when you have a government that's functionally insolvent, the Fed providing various liquidity solutions doesn't work. And I think you're seeing more and more of that going on where there is either in the corporate sector uh, insolvencies that need to be dealt with and the way the private sector deals with that is by letting those companies go away. 
Uh, if you don't do that, you distort the markets. And so I sort of, um, um, you know, the uh, liquidation of the debt uh, enables you to kind of purge the system of the bad assets. With governments, it's a little trickier. The way you have to deal with insolvent nation states is by um, austerity, by cutting back, by re getting more revenue and less expenses, and it usually involves dealing with public pension finances. And uh, no central bank is equipped to deal with those things. Of course, most governments in their relationship with their populations are not set up to deal with those things. Uh, so it's a complicated deal. Um, the point I'm, I, I guess I'm trying to make is that we are living in a time where there's a lot of questions of the global growth story and a lot of questions around where central banks are going to uh, take things. And in the midst of that, it's very important that we formulate an asset allocation that, for our clients that reflects the top-down views we have about growth and the Fed. And when um, you don't really know exactly what will happen to global growth, you, you have to create an asset allocation that reflects any kind of season. And uh, that's certainly what we've done. Um, by the way, on that issue of the excessive debt and the Fed being aware of a negative feedback loop, if they were to raise rates and in the middle of an excessive debt cycle, the debt to GDP ratio in the United States is still a little bit less than half of what it is in Japan. Now, Japan's a really bad outlier and not an example I want to use since they've been in this debt spiral for, let's call it, 30 years. Uh, but I do want to put it in perspective. And the United States debt to GDP ratio is just now getting back to essentially where it was post-World War II, which was very, very high, and it hasn't been that high since until this time. Um, but we are not dealing with a debt to GDP that transcends anything we've ever seen before. We have seen it before. It's still too high. So I thought that was worth sharing. I um, am going to leave it there for the video this week. We, uh, we really do wish you and yours a wonderful um, Easter weekend and and encourage you to reach out to us with any more questions. We're into earnings season. Um, lots to, to talk about there, but I uh, need to get back into it. So reach out to me with any questions you have in the meantime. And thanks for listening and viewing uh, our Dividend Cafe video. And feel free to check out our podcast, uh, the Dividend Cafe podcast, uh, which I'm going to record next, by the way. And then our Advice and Insights podcast, where I'm running a special series right now on the dividend growth book that I just wrote and making that argument the case for dividend growth. So thank you uh, very much for viewing, and we look forward to uh, coming back to you next week with more. Take care.